Hello, and welcome to the Ada Bible Church Beyond the Weekend podcast, where we debrief each weekend sermon, focusing on extra points of connection and what there just wasn't time for in the sermon. I'm your host, Amelia Rhodes, and I'm the Director of Resources at Ada Bible Church. I help lead the team that writes our daily devotional Beyond the Weekend and some of our other curriculum and content across the church, and I'm excited to be here with you today. I'm thrilled for you to join us for this episode, and we are excited, whether you're a regular attendee of our church, a visitor, or a listener from afar, we hope this podcast will challenge you to study God's Word, grow in your relationship with Him. But just a reminder, you'll appreciate the podcast the most if you've already heard the weekend sermon. So if you missed it, I encourage you to pause the podcast right now, click on the link for the sermon in the show notes for this podcast, and listen to it before coming back. This week, I'm joined by my regular co-host, Stephen Lewis. Stephen's our pastor of spiritual formation. Welcome, Stephen. Thanks. Good to be here. And what all does pastor of spiritual formation include? What part of the church? Yeah, that's exactly the question my uh, 15-year-old daughter asked when she saw my name tag outside my office one day. But um, it essentially is trying to think and be strategic about how we grow in our relationship with God. And so it uh, involves our all the way from our children's team all the way to our adults team. And so we're trying to work together and think about how can we grow and make the most of our time here on earth and uh, do the things God asks us to do and grow oh. to be more like him. That's great. Thanks for the work you do and thanks for being here today. Also joining us is our senior teaching pastor, Aaron Buer. Welcome, Aaron. Hey, hey. Hey, we see you teach every weekend, or at least this weekend. It was Saturday. <laughs> That's right. Once a weekend. Yeah, part of the weekend. <laughs> part of the weekend <laughs> yeah, this week. Yeah. A little unique. But what might be something about you or the role that our listeners wouldn't know? Uh, well, we're, we're recording this on Monday, and uh, I was up late last night watching the Detroit Lions because I'm a fan. So that's a little something about me that maybe you didn't know. So awesome. if I fall asleep during this podcast, uh, I blame the Detroit Lions. <laughs> We're up a little late. <laughs> do, we, do we need to take a moment and say that for some of you listening, uh, last night the Lions victory might have been the first time you've seen a Lions win a playoff game and just how significant of a moment that was for many of us here in Michigan. <laughs> like in your lifetime. <laughs> yes, yeah. your, your whole yeah, lifetime. Yeah, it was pretty big. You know, yeah. I was in middle school the last time right. that they won a game <laughs> in the playoffs. So yeah, that was fun. Michigan's mm -hmm. having a good run right now. That's right. It's, it's been a good week. Right yeah. Now. yeah, it's been it a great has week. been. Mm -hmm. Well, today we're going to start by going through really our vision for the podcast. You shared a little bit of that in the weekend service on Saturday. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about what our vision and hope and prayer for the podcast is, and we'll dig deeper into the sermon, covering some things that didn't make it into the sermon, how the content, how the content is impacting us personally, and then we'll answer some questions, and we're really excited about getting questions from all of you. So please find that link in the show notes and submit your questions about the sermon or the podcast or James, and we'd be happy to take some of those. So as we get started, this is something actually that we've talked about for a while. Aaron, I've heard you and Stephen talk about this idea for a podcast for quite some time. So why this podcast and why now? It's a good question. Uh, I mean, for me, uh, I love the idea of an opportunity to return to the series that we're in, to uh, return to the scriptures halfway through the week. I think that'd be really beneficial for all of us in our church. Uh, personally, you know, I mentioned this uh, when I was preaching this weekend, but there's always content that I want to talk about on the weekend, but shouldn't from the standpoint of talking for hours. <laughs> so <laughs> this podcast creates an opportunity to, to maybe go a little bit deeper in some areas, uh, to bring up some ideas that uh, just didn't make the final version of the sermon. So I'm excited about uh, all those reasons. Yeah, I think it'll be a neat little behind the curtain, yeah. extra content. Sometimes we hear that on Tuesdays when we meet with the writing team for mm -hmm. the daily devotional. And so it's always neat to be able to share that with others as well. Yeah, you know, something uh, that everybody probably doesn't know is uh, Amelia and Stephen are actually pretty instrumental in the sermon uh, writing process for me. We meet together uh, usually twice uh, during the week mm -hmm. to for me to read through the sermon and they give me feedback, and so uh, they they have a pretty significant voice in the in the process. So uh, they'll probably be able to share some things uh, uh, that are kind of unique about you know each individual sermon. And some of the things that we see because of that is it's not like you're grading your thing on a one to ten scale and be like, well, let me cut the threes. Mm -hmm. You're cutting some nines and tens um, because of time and what God has on your heart. So there's a lot of good content 
uh, that does get cut. So we're looking forward to being able to talk about that as it comes up over the course of the series. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. Stephen, what are your, some, uh, some of your hopes for the podcast? Yeah, I mean, some of it's I've just seen some really good stuff cut. Mm-hmm. Um, and it doesn't mean it doesn't ever return in a future sermon yeah. down the road. And so just an opportunity to talk about that. And then I was thinking even as I've been thinking about this podcast, getting ready for it, just that I really do hope that this encourages some people to have conversations like this. Mm-hmm. Conversations around, okay, here are the things Aaron or Jeff or whoever talked about this weekend. And where do we see connections in other parts of the Bible and what other verses going with this? And just make it a part of our life to have a conversation around God and his word. Yeah, it's good. It's one more way to return to the content throughout the week. So we aren't just a hearer of the word, but a doer of the word, like James teaches us. And yeah. I, I love that as an extra point of content of I can get to Monday even and forget, oh, that's what God taught me. That's what I need to put in place in my life and yeah. start applying. And so I love that for our friends to be able to have that one more point of connection of what God was teaching you and to be able to act on that throughout yeah. the week and doing so in community, whether it's with your small group or friends that you chat with about. So we're excited for that. Well, this sermon was titled Faith and Trials, and we were in James chapter one. Yeah. Stephen, can you give us a quick recap of the points that Aaron gave us? Yeah. So uh, three, three point sermon. And the first part of it was with James talking about whenever. And that's the idea that when we're in trials, it's normal. Trials are going to come. It's just part of life. And then uh, the second part was choosing to grow and this idea that trials per, um, produce perseverance in us, uh, which does lead to maturity. Mm-hmm. And it really is a choice. There's a line in there. Um, I can't even remember. I don't have it up in front of me now. But um, to let perseverance do its work mm-hmm. yep. so that we can become mature. And so that it doesn't always mean that just a trial is going to lead. It's not a mathematical equation where A plus B always equals C. It's no, we have to do uh, our part and partner with the Holy Spirit. And then uh, the end of that is kind of about that partnering with the Holy Spirit, which is asking and trusting. Mm -hmm. It's that um, God does care about what you're going through. He's concerned about the trials you're facing. And so we are to bring uh, what we're requesting in the midst of those trials to God and then trust that God has our best interests at heart and that he will care for us in the midst of those three things. So it's normal. We have to choose to grow and ask and trust. Yeah, and it was really powerful sermon. I'm sad everyone didn't get to hear it because I was there Saturday night, and I know my husband and I had really meaningful conversations with people after the sermon mm-hmm. who were just really processing trials that they're in and how they can grow and choose to trust. So we're excited to dig into this a little more. Now, Aaron, this was a unique weekend. You yeah. only preached this one once. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. It's so odd. Normally, you know, uh, preach on Saturday, have a conversation. Uh, about how to improve the sermon following the service. Um, and I actually had that conversation uh, this weekend and then didn't get an opportunity to, yeah. <laughs> to preach it again. Because normally what I do is I take a bunch of notes in that feedback conversation following the service, and then I wake up on Sunday early and just make some adjustments. And so I woke up early on Sunday and Instead, we were, you know, had to cancel church. And so there was part of me that was like, well, this is kind of nice, you know, hanging yeah. out with the family. And then another part that was like, man, I really would have liked to have another run at this sermon. So, oh, yeah, no, it was we a unique weekend. Some chance to do that here. Yeah, let me just preach what I wanted to <laughs> preach real quick. So, how long, how much time do we have? No? Well, it's funny because. <laughs> We joke internally as staff, those of us that are on the Beyond the Weekend team, that sometimes we call Saturday the director's cut. Yeah. Because it's yeah. sometimes a little bit longer on yeah. Saturday because there are adjustments that are made from Saturday to Sunday. And so you yeah. get the chance to do that. Everyone got the director's cut. That's right. Week. Yeah. You know, I try really hard to to bring uh, my best, in a sense, on Saturday. But there, yeah, inevitably, we do make some changes. And often it's make it a little shorter mm-hmm. <laughs> because, you know... Nobody wants a 45 minute, 50 minute sermon. You know, we aim actually for 35 minutes. And now that you heard me say that, you're going to try to hold me to it. And I don't, well, I rarely hit it, but that's the goal. So, yeah. It's Everyone's going to start their timers now. Yeah, this right. Yeah. So, what are the things that you would have included if you'd had more time in this particular sermon in James 1? Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the passage that I was uh, tackling was actually. Um, Chapter 1, verse 1, all the way to verse 18. Um, and so there is a section, and I actually have my Bible with me, that is directly related to, I think, to trials um, that we didn't cover. And it, and it goes like this. It's verse 13. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, 
nor does he tempt anyone, but each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. So the idea here, I think, is um, you know trials and temptation. And the point of the sermon this past weekend was when you're in trials, choose to persevere, choose to trust God because you know He's doing something in you. He's He's creating uh, the mm-hmm. character of Christ in you. Um, and so we have a choice where we can endure and trust, or and this is unfortunately often the case, or we can give into temptation because when you're in trial, there's always a temptation. And so uh, part of what James is saying here is, you know, there is another way where you choose selfishness, you choose your own way. And um, he goes as far to say in verse 15, he says, then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin and sin when it is full grown gives birth to death. Mm -hmm. And so it's this Mm -hmm. idea that, um, when you give into temptation, when you sin, um, there's always going to be some kind of a death mm-hmm. that you experience, and and we know from the scriptures that the 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 result of sin on sort of like a cosmic level is death. You know that is why we experience death. That is, um, you know, probably also alluding to the existence of hell and that kind of thing. But there's also this aspect of it where like something will die mm-hmm. when you sin. Um, sometimes. That can be uh, a relationship, you know, sometimes that, I mean, it can be all kinds of stuff, but it's just James giving a warning. Um, yeah, really be careful what you choose when you're facing a trial, because there are incredible opportunities for growth and there are pretty strong warnings of uh, negative consequences by choosing the wrong things. So none of that made it into the sermon. Uh, it could have been a, a pretty strong, probably fourth point, but mm-hmm. again, I always have to make decisions on, you know, what fits best. You know, I, I do a lot of praying, you know, mm-hmm. what, God, what do your people need to hear? Guide me to that. Um, and so, yeah, at the end of the day, that wasn't in the sermon. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. And I, we think about sin leading to death on that big cosmic s- scale, but I don't think we always think about it in that daily choice or facing that trial, what, how that's going to impact something that might die yeah. here, here and now. It's yeah. not just about where we spend eternity, but it's how we live today. Yep. And it's interesting, the agency we have in verse 15, because it says, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to death, um, yep. to sin, and yep. sin, when it's fully grown, gives birth to death. Mm-hmm. And it's like, again, we have the this is normal about trials, but I think we have the this is normal about a desire to do something wrong. Oh, sure. Mm-hmm. And so it's, okay, what are you going to do with that? And in the, I think part of what James is saying is like, in trial, it's easier maybe to do something wrong <laughs> and to turn away yeah. from God. And yeah. so really guard your heart here. And he goes on down below mm-hmm. and um, more in that passage we didn't have time to cover. But as a reminder, hey, every good and perfect gift is from mm-hmm. above. Yeah, And so that is one of the ways to get through trials as a reflection on the um, the good that God has given us. Mm-hmm. And are you going to focus on the negative or the positive? And it's not always that simple, mm-hmm. but that is one of the uh, tools sure. God has given us. Yep. To navigate trials. Yeah, you're, you're totally right. One of the things I've really learned about sin throughout my life is kind of these levels of what we experience with sin. And, and when we put our faith and trust in Jesus, we're freed from its penalty. Kind of we mm, always think yeah. of the three Ps. Like we're freed from the penalty yep. of sin. And we are throughout our life as we cooperate with the Holy Spirit and choose how we respond to things and trials and cooperate with the Holy Spirit. We're being gradually freed from its power, like has less and less power over us here and how we respond in trials is one of them. And then one day, we will be completely removed from its presence, that its sin is not eternal. It will be eradicated forever. And I yeah. find that great hope that I Seriously. can grow in being released from its power. Yeah, definitely. Well, was there anything you wish you could have spent more time talking about that you talked about and maybe you would have tweaked from Saturday to Sunday or just something you're like, oh, if I had more time, I would have said a little more here. Yeah. Um, it, it, well, it relates to one of the questions. And I don't know, should we read that now? Should we postpone that for later in the conversation? Let's go ahead and go yeah. there now. I'll... So one of the things we you know, did, and I mentioned this in the sermon, is we were inviting questions mm-hmm. from the congregation. And so uh, you want to read one yeah, of those? Yeah, I'll read that. So yeah. this was a question that came in from someone that heard the sermon. It says, Aaron, in your first sermon of the series, you asked a question at the end, which was, why do you doubt? 
which was asking why we doubt God will give us good gifts. You listed some reasons as to why we may doubt, which were really good reasons. But for me personally, I find myself doubting because sometimes God says yes to the things we ask for, and sometimes he says no. And everyone says that when you ask God for things, sometimes he just says yes, and sometimes he says no, and we need to have faith that that's his ultimate plan. So how can we believe and not have doubt when sometimes he says no to things? Yeah, yeah. That and we're, Let's see, we were— uh... In the sermon, we were talking about... I was under that third the, point, uh, ask and yeah. trust. Oh, yeah. But when you ask, and I asked the question, ask for what you need. When you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Yeah. Okay. So that's the scripture. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I really kind of wrestled with during the week the difference between what you need and what you want. And mm-hmm. um, sometimes those can be hard to distinguish. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with asking God for what you want, you know, but, but contextually in this passage we were talking about, what I, what I really wanted to make clear was ask God for what you need so that you can persevere mm-hmm. and trust him. So uh, the, I was really trying to focus in on what is it that you need in order to make the right choices in this trial and not just a wide, um, you know, what do, what do you need? What do you want? And I wasn't, I'm not sure that, that was really clear in uh, the Saturday night sermon. So I, I would have liked to have another run at that and just try to clarify a little bit the difference between want and need. And also just, um, you know, sometimes God doesn't give you what you want. And sometimes he allows things to happen in your life that don't let, make a lot of sense, uh, can be hard. And uh, I believe that he has a good reason for it, uh, but we don't always get clarity on it. And I thought of another passage, uh, and it's from Jeremiah, it's one of the more f- famous verses out there. Isaiah, Jeremiah, okay, there we go. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's 2911, uh, and I bet most of you have heard this, um, if I can find it. This, so the context of this is God has sent his people into exile. Mm-hmm. And they're suffering. I mean, they were conquered. It was it was an ugly situation. And in that context, God says to them through the prophet Jeremiah, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. And we love that verse because of the way that it sounds. But mm-hmm. when you put it in its context, it's pretty challenging because it's, hey, you're living in Babylon. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Your country yeah. was just destroyed. Uh, You are essentially slaves of the Babylonians. And uh, I know that none of you like where you're at right now. And by the way, God knows the plans that he has for you. (laughs) And it's, you know, speaking to the nation of Israel, this is for your good. This is to kind of bring you back to me in a sense that you can be my people again. And so um, to think of that passage in the context of the trials that we go through, and some of the, even like the significant trials that we go through to go, okay, God is in control. God has a plan. Um, he has a purpose here. And even, I mean, this is hard, but even if you're dealing with a life-threatening disease or cancer, to know that God has a greater purpose that may be even bigger than your life. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's mm-hmm. just, it, it's a hard truth to wrestle with, but it's also incredibly reassuring that God is telling this grand story that's bigger than me and you that extends beyond even our lives. And uh, he's doing something good through it, even when we can't see it. So I would have loved to get into some of that, just not time Mm -hmm. for all of that. Don't you think that's something that the early readers um, of James would have understood, right? I mean, this is first century. Their, um, Their first pastor had been martyred already. Yeah. And true. James is now the second pastor of the Jerusalem Church. And they're both Maybe, named James, They're right? both named James. We yeah. might be able to get into that a little more later. Yeah. Um, and they're also, their lives probably feel like they're on the line. And mm-hmm. I think they probably know people, other people who have been killed. Yeah. And so I don't think it's out of bounds for us to say, yeah, some of this maturity is actually possibly leading in a, someone losing their life. And I know... Mm-hmm. Um, that doesn't make it any easier to be dealing with a trial where yeah. your life is on the line. But yeah. um, hopefully, you know, this isn't written to people who are just in a great sh- space. You know, they're, no. in a, they're in tough space. Yeah. They're in the midst of it. And James is still saying, choose joy, mm-hmm. you know, ask for the right thing. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And looking for God's generosity in it. And I'm sure we've all learned that 
we can ask for what we want and but what we think we need might not be what God knows we really need and it's trusting in the character of God, his sovereignty, his generosity, his care, his love yeah. for us. Um, a phrase that I've tried to use throughout my life, encourage other friends and family to, to think about when asking is ask, 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 but ask with open hands mm-hmm. and not demands. Um, just really open handed towards God of I trust you that you see the bigger picture because we do, we're finite. We see just this tiny little spot on the yep. timeline and he sees the whole timeline. And I think of the people that he wrote that in Jeremiah to, they didn't see the end of the exile right. in their lifetime. Yeah, so. true. I think that whole thing, I even look back on my own life and the tr- some of the most significant trials, I have asked for something different than the outcome. Mm-hmm. And yet now when I look back at it, I'm kind of glad I didn't get what I asked for. Yeah, mm-hmm. um, God had... You know, using Jeremiah language, he had plans for me that were better than the ones even I had for myself in yeah. some ways, and also um, in some pain, some opportunity to um, minister to other people who have gone mm-hmm. through some similar situations. And so I don't even know, and that's why I love is like ask for wisdom, and you're talking about the ask for the thing, but also ask for wisdom yep. to get through it. Yep. And uh, I think that way you get, at least you're getting one. Of them, hopefully, you know, you might not get what you what you, what you feel like you need, but yeah. God will give you know give you yeah. the wisdom you need, mm-hmm. and then maybe five ten years down the road, you'll look back on it and say, "Oh, God actually knew." Shockingly, God knew better what I needed in that than I yeah. did. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's something else in in uh, James chapter one that we didn't cover and and probably won't cover in this series that I think is really powerful, especially as these uh, first generation believers were truly suffering and being killed. In this verse 18 where James writes, he chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be Mm -hmm. a kind of first fruits of all he created. And first fruits is a very uh, Jewish Old Testament idea. It has to do with this um, uh, sacrifice that they would give, like the very first of the crops they would give to God uh, in anticipation that he would provide the rest and also just to express gratitude. But it became this idea around Jesus where his resurrection is like the first fruits of our resurrection. Mm -hmm. And so for them, I think James is saying, you know, uh, your your suffering, your resurrection, the work that God is doing in you, the restoration work that he's doing in you, it's like a first fruits of all that's to come Mm -hmm. down the road. And that's just, uh, even when you go through severe suffering, and it's the kind that, you know, is going to end in death to recognize this idea of first fruits, that this isn't the end of the story, mm-hmm. that Jesus was the mm-hmm. first fruits of, uh, of, of the resurrection that those of us who are in Christ will experience in, a, in a, a restored, perfect earth, like you were talking about, Amelia, with no more sin. I mean, that's a powerful idea yeah. and a, an incredible context for, for pain and suffering. So That hope we have. The Oh, we've mentioned it probably a few times in sermons, the already and the not yet, what yeah. we already have, but not yet that we're hoping yep. for, and uh, God has promised. So as we think about the book of James, and we're introducing this series and the book, there's some interesting characteristics to the book of James in yeah. particular, and you yeah. talked about how it's kind of punchy. <laughs> it's the spiritual punch to the gut. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way I like to think of it. It's so true. And it reads kind of a lot like Proverbs. Yeah. And I think understanding what, what kind of book this is and a little bit about James helps us as we get started. So let's talk maybe a little bit about what kind of literature this is that we're reading in the book of James. Yeah. Well, there's a word, genre, mm-hmm. um, which you know has to do with the type of literature that you're reading. And of course, you know, we understand this uh, in just the regular stuff that we read, like the difference between an encyclopedia and a novel and, you know, all the different kinds of writing out there. You have to understand what you're reading in order to understand what it means. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, there are some uh, biblical scholars who would say James is a type of wisdom literature, meaning that it's very similar to Proverbs. Um, Stephen, you're like, I rely on you quite a bit. uh, Well, both of you, but Stephen, uh, for your understanding of the scriptures. So it, the, the genre of wisdom literature, like how would you describe that mm-hmm. and how does it impact how we interpret the Bible? Um, so what I've kind of always heard is wisdom literature is general truth. Okay. Um, and so they're not to be taken necessarily as you like A plus B equals C. 
mm-hmm. even though, so that's, that's how it commonly works. Um, but it's not, especially as you look at pro- Proverbs and it's not promises that God has made. Um, but it's like, this is generally how life works. Yep. And then there was this, um, I'm not super familiar with it, but I know there was a whole um, group of Jewish wisdom literature that was out there. And so this wouldn't have been new type of literature right. for James's readers. Yep. It, um, mm-hmm. It's something that had continued on. and um, But it also kind of can be, like I said, punchy, but it can be full of commands, like do this type of thing. I think of Proverbs where it's like, my son, do this thing, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. So James is kind of yeah. like that. I think there are over 50 different types of do this um, commands yep. inside of um, James. And then also some just statements about um, the truth of life, right? And that's what Proverbs can be that way as well. And so I, when I think about James, like it has that section on the tongue, right? That's just a general statement yeah. Yeah, about, yeah. Um, you know, like a, a ship can be stirred by a rudder, right? A little one small thing can stir some, can um, yep. steer something. Yep. And so that's the idea of the wisdom, kind of like universal type principles. And I think James is mixing Jesus in with wisdom literature. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, we see that, in like Revelation with apocalyptic literature that was heavy at that time as well. And so we're mixing Jesus in and I'm not, and I'm not trying to be um, irreverent. I think, you know, James is taking a literature form that was common in his day. Yep. Um, just like, I think mm-hmm. Jesus, you know, if the apostles were today, I think we'd, they'd be posting things on Facebook almost, you know, like they're <laughs> using what they have as their yeah. um, current literature form. And they're, they're looking at it through the lens of Jesus. How does Jesus inform the way that these types of things are written? Yeah. Yeah. That's really good. And, um, you know, some of what you were saying, that doesn't mean that we don't take it literally. No. Mm-hmm. It's just understanding, like, for example, when Proverbs promises something, it's almost like if you, you know, a, plus B equals C in the Proverbs. It just states it yeah. flat out. And it's the the truth of it is it's a general principle. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the majority of time, for example, if you do this, then this is the result you're going to get. But, of course, we know for life that from life that's not always how it works. So they're true. This is how you should live. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's the right way. Uh, just don't take it as math or, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. you, you might be disappointed. Um, I was looking through Proverbs trying to come up with a um, a good example. I'm kind of, I, up kind of blank. I always think but. of the one about, uh, and I won't be like quite perfectly, about train up a child in the way they should go yeah. and they yeah, won't depart from it, right? And yeah. I think some parents have read that and been like, I messed up. And well, of course, we all mess up as parents, yeah. but that doesn't mean that uh, we're the reason yeah. our kids have mm-hmm. you know abandoned faith for a season mm-hmm. um, or something like that. It wasn't that you didn't train them up in the way they should go. They're still kids who can make their own decisions as they turn into adults and mm-hmm. things like that. So yeah. that's always one example that I yeah, think Yeah, so of. it's true. You should train up your mm-hmm. kids in the way of the mm-hmm. Lord. It's just not a guarantee right, because right. kids, as much as I hate this, have their own brain <laughs> and independent <laughs> will. <laughs> the older they get too. Something else that I've noticed about James and that I've read is that there are a lot of tie-ins to the Sermon on the mm-hmm. Mount. So oh, you, yeah. That's you read, totally true. Yeah, if you read especially Matthew 5 through 7, and this week as we were studying for James and preparing for the sermon, I was in, mm-hmm. my di- daily Bible reading was in Matthew 5, and I was like, wait, that sounds just like James. And so it's just yeah, you know, fascinating to think yep. of James, the brother of Jesus, knowing the Sermon on the Mount, one of Jesus' main teachings yep. that he probably repeated over and over, not just that one time, yep. and to see the tie-ins. And so the one that stood out to me this week was Matthew 5, 11 through 12. It's another place where Jesus talks about his followers facing trials. And he says, Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Yeah. So yeah. there's quite a few uh, tie-ins that you'll see. Definitely. I, I've, some of the scholars I read in preparation for this series basically argue that James is kind of a commentary on the Sermon on the Mount. That's what it is. So that yeah, that's interesting you brought that up. And something else. This is for free. I discovered last week that uh, the Bible Project, mm-hmm. they're doing a really big podcast uh, on the Sermon on the Mount. So Yes. Cool. They just released yeah. a brand new video series <laughs> on the Sermon on the yeah. Mount. I've heard great things about it. Yeah. I bet it'll be good. So the Bible Project is, um, it started as kind of an explanation to each book of the Bible, I believe. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like a video. And, uh, video yeah. explainers. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And they're, they're really good. We can put them in the show notes. Yeah. Um, I'll link to their website. 
a great resource for you as you're trying to understand how the Bible works together and different mm-hmm. things like that. Yeah, they've moved not just from books of the Bible, but to different words or yeah. themes or storylines, and then yep. something like this, the Sermon on the yep. Mount. Great resource. It is. Well, as we look into the points of the sermon, cover each one maybe a little briefly, but the first one was this is normal, and really that shifting of expectations, and I'm sure we could all comment on how trials have been normal in our lives, but why is it so important that people have that expectation that trials are normal? Yeah, I think it's because if you don't have that expectation, uh, trials will uh, wreck you. (laughs) Essentially, mm-hmm. I mean, they'll mm-hmm. really knock you over and they can disrupt your faith. Uh, you know, I really wanted to communicate like Jesus promised we're going to have trouble. So uh, because so often I've had so many conversations with people where it's like, I'm going through this. How could God let me go through this? Mm-hmm. And, you know, it, it's OK to wrestle with that. Definitely. But um, we we tend to equate if my life is good, then God must love me. Mm-hmm. And if my life is bad, then God must not love me. Yeah. And that's just not. What the scriptures teach. Yeah, think like think if Jesus felt that way about the Father. Yeah. <laughs> right? right. I mean, he had complete trust that the Father loved him and was on his side. Um, and yet he did not have an easy life. You no. know, once he stepped into the octagon no. of ministry, it was the uh, octagon of ministry. Yeah, That's a good <laughs> it was a, That's your next a book, battle. Steve. Yeah. yeah. Um so. And I it, know, oh, sorry. Oh, I was just say, you know, one of my personal struggles throughout life as one who came to faith early and made my faith my own in my teenage years and really tried to follow God. You know, I don't have this big rebellion story. And I still had some really hard trials. And a turning point in my life was when I got to this point and I just kind of cried out, like, I've I've done everything right. I've followed. I've obeyed. Like, yeah. why? This isn't fair. Right. And Jesus really meeting me in that moment of it's not about not having trials or struggles, but how I'm going to be with you in it Mm, and knowing that some of these things don't go away. Some of the things I still struggle with, but seeing his power and presence in them has shaped me Mm, uh, in ways that couldn't have been shaped without them. Yeah. Wow. I mean, that sounds like Paul, right? He said, I I can't remember the exact wording, but he he had this thing he called this thorn in his Mm -hmm. flesh. Mm -hmm. That I, I don't know what it was. It might have been physical. It might have been emotional. I don't know. But he asked God specifically to take it away three times. And, and God, Jesus basically said, you know, my strength uh, is sufficient. Is that when that my happens? Grace. Or, uh, my yeah. grace. Yeah, yeah, my grace yeah. is sufficient. There you go. And so just like you're saying. And then something else uh, that just struck me as we were talking is, um, you know, talking about doubt, talking about struggling in the trial. Um, I mean, Jesus... Even even Jesus on the cross said, you know, why have you forsaken yeah. me? Mm-hmm. And so I, I don't think it's wrong or bad to wrestle with it, you know, and to go like, God, why is mm-hmm. this happening? And I don't understand. And where are you? I mean, even Jesus essentially yeah. said, why? why? And he knew the plan, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, mm-hmm. So um, it's legit to wrestle. But just a reminder, this is normal and God is with you and God mm-hmm. is, you know, wanting to produce something in you. And Jesus is quoting David. There, uh, yeah, true. Mm-hmm. And um, I think we did a series. It's called the language of trust or um, poetry of trust. Uh, poetry of trust. I don't know. It was yeah. on the laments, mm-hmm. yeah, which I think okay. the laments are a great, a great way to approach trial. Um, it's and you're stating what's going wrong. Mm-hmm. You state what you'd like God to do, but you end with trust. Yeah, and that's very similar to what we talked about with James. It's, yep. He's almost giving us a lament. Yeah, um, mm-hmm. type pattern. It's not quite the same, but um, that's a good resource for people who are in the midst of trial. I remember going through that, and mm-hmm. um, the response was, "I." A lot of people really needed that for the season they yeah. were in. Yeah. yeah, and so if you're in a season where you're struggling through a major trial, and I know there are a lot of people who are. Yeah. We we know if um, people are going through health things or uh, family things. That that sermon series is a very great resource mm-hmm. um, for you. We can throw that in the show notes as well. Yeah, sure. You you did something in the sermon that Uh-oh. I caught. No, oh, it's great. Uh-oh. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, oh. And it, many of our women in women's ministry may have caught it as well. It's a practice that we have talked about a a, a practice of prayer. Okay. Super simple. And we call it a breath prayer, but you Hmm. even said, like, when something happens, like, take a deep breath (laughs) and (laughs) and refocus. I'm like, that's it. And just being intentional, you know, something happens, you're confronted with something, you don't know what to do, but really that just pause, take a deep breath. And we often talk about, you know, a scripture in and a scripture out, Hmm. but a way to, you know, on the inhale, like, okay, 
this is normal. Yeah. And on the exile, yeah. God, you're good. <laughs> yeah. Just a simple prayer practice that we've talked about. But in that moment, especially when yeah. the emotions are high, uh, yeah. you can just quickly fly off the handle or lose it, which yeah. is all of us. Oh, It's totally true. And it takes practice. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, that was I stole. I told the story of the of my Highlander getting smashed, and 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 the funny thing is, just this morning I was at the same coffee shop. Oh no! And uh, don't worry, my Highlander's fine. Okay, I was gonna uh, say, please, like, this is not again, not a third. But I got a I got a phone call. My we have an old truck that my son drives around, mm-hmm. and got a phone call from the shop. You know, it's like I'm not sure we're gonna be able to fix it because it's been having problems, right. and this thing is like a million years old. And so I'm on the phone with the guy, and I just feel myself getting frustrated, you know, like, oh. So, again, in that moment, just to take a deep breath and, man. Mm -hmm. And we talked about this, uh, I think, Thursday during sermon rehearsal, but we couldn't quite figure out how to get into the sermon. But this idea that this is a skill you build up, and it doesn't just start with a big trial. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? It's not something that you can just um, flick on with that phone call in the middle of the night or the time in the... uh, the waiting room or the doctor's office. It's something you have to be able to work up to this by trusting when you're something random, like a lawnmower hits your car or, uh, you know, in in December, you know, like you, you, your car won't start on a four degree morning, you know, things like that. Like that's where you build this skill of saying, Hey, this is normal. God, I trust you in the midst of this. It's not a big deal. Mm -hmm. I'm going to, You know, it's not going to derail my life for the rest of my day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then as we learn that skill, then we're able to, through trust, um, practice it in those really hard moments. Yeah, it's a choice to grow. And that really moves us into the second point Mm -hmm. where you were urging us to choose to grow. Because just because you have a trial doesn't mean you will grow or Mm -hmm. your faith will deepen. It can do the opposite. So we talked about perseverance. It's earned through pain and that we can grow in the character of Christ. And you really had this moment where you said, don't waste this trial. Yeah. And that was, brings us to another question that we received of how do you how do you know if you're wasting your trial? Oh, yeah. You know, I think for me, so I I don't like conflict. I don't like hard things. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, you know, Pastor Jeff. He's he's run like twelve marathons. I'm never going to run a marathon. <laughs> I, it's just too much pain. You know. <laughs> so so my first response when things is are hard, I want out immediately. Mm. If it's a hard conversation, I want it to end. If my kid is acting up, I want them to stop, you know? And so I want out quickly and I want the pain to go away. And um, <laughs> James is saying, look, you, you got to let perseverance finish its work. And so it, I guess what I'm saying is sometimes that just the, a way to waste your trial is you, you don't endure it. Mm. You don't walk through it. Um, and you just try to get out of it as soon as you can when sometimes... Usually, we just have to walk through those times and allow God to work and be faithful and endure. Um, and if you have a personality type like mine, or you just want out, sometimes you're tempted to take shortcuts. That's where you're tempted yeah. to give in mm-hmm. to temptation because you just don't want to be in whatever that negative space is. And uh, and and then God, you know, you lose that opportunity for for growing. It it seems like we've heard our um, counselors that we refer people to say things about how we're just filling up our time with busyness or yeah. uh, other types of activities that I think can really help us waste our trial too, because we don't, we're not actually saying, okay, wh- at this moment in my life, what should I be learning? Which is something we should be saying almost all the time, but also in trail trials. Yeah. So if we have something kind of traumatic or bad happen and all of a sudden we're just move on to the next thing, like it didn't even happen, we're probably not maximizing what God wants for us to sit down and think, okay, why did that impact me? Why did I get so upset? What mm-hmm. happened? You know, how did I respond to the people around me? What do I need to do differently the next time that mm-hmm. types of things happen? Yeah, totally. um, I think that's one way we can make sure we we don't waste our trials. Okay, have we kind of debriefed how we how it impacted us afterward? So that's an afterward, and then in the middle of it, um, the people I've seen maximize their trials the most, whether they're big trials or little trials are the people who can balance um, doing the things they need to do to handle whatever the trial is, but also remembering that that is not the entirety of life for Mm -hmm. them or for the people around them. Yeah. And so they're, you know, whether it's a health scare, they're doing the things, they're going to the doctor's appointment, they're doing the research, whatever, but they're also still engaging and trying to not make it all about that Mm -hmm. or still, you know, reading their Bible. They're still going to church. They're still praying. They're, 
They're still in, they're looking for ways to encourage other people. And so that seems to me to be another way I've seen people maximize yeah. their trials. Mm-hmm. Mm, that's good. That intentional decision to lean in and look yeah. for ways to learn and grow mm-hmm. from it. It's not easy. And I, it's a skill, a discipline, I think, that we grow in uh, in the small trials than oh, yeah. through the big trials. I would say I'm still a rookie. Mm-hmm. You know, like this is kind of a, a new learning for me, mm-hmm. newer learning right. to, to really be honest and sit there and all that. Right. I, but I also am like, I don't know that I want to pay the price to be a veteran <laughs> here either. You know, it's like one of those things like, yeah. yeah, I do acknowledge that we grow through our trials, but I'm like, I'm not in a hurry right. to become an expert at this. Yeah, I don't so. need my 10,000 hours there. <laughs> yeah. I don't think we have to go looking for them. They will right. come yeah. um, embracing where they are. So then the third point was ask and trust. And mm-hmm. you talked about God being generous and we can trust us. He will meet us with what we need. And we talked about this a little bit already with the question we had from the attender. Um, but what are some of the ways that we can ask and trust and grow through that? Hmm. I, I've got a personal example of something that we went through that still impacts us today. So about 10 years ago, my husband had thyroid cancer. Yeah. We were at a stage of the kids were young, middle school, uh, elementary school, little came out of nowhere, like no warning, just one day, regular doctor's appointment, there you got cancer. Wow. Um, and so... That was a trial, and we saw God meet us in really personal ways. But really, I think what impacted us the most was what happened after mm. that and the fallout after. Mm. You almost grieve later, but then you know, all the bills that pile up oh, and geez, you have insurance. Yeah. Anyone yeah. who's gone through health you know, struggles, you know, it's, just, it's not just that. It's all the other things, mm. the, the emotional impact, but then the financial impact. And, and then we were in a season where we were one income at the time, and— a lot of our life has changed because of that event. A lot of what we do today is different. Mm. And it was, you know, then the dishwasher breaks and then the mm. washing machine mm. breaks. And it was like yeah. one thing after another. Oh, and you're like goodness. paycheck to paycheck. And I I remember when I hit the point of, okay, I'm at a fork in the road. Am I going to become bitter over this yeah. and resentful and angry? Or am I going to choose to trust? And one of the practices I chose in the middle of that was gratitude. Mm. I'm like, okay, I don't know how I'm going to do laundry today. I mean, it involved like hauling stuff up to a laundry mat, oh, two little kids, yeah. hauling yeah. it back home to dry it, you know, because you couldn't <laughs> afford the washer and the dryer. Right. And it's just, it was very inconvenient. Yeah. And we couldn't fix it all right away. And I remember choosing, I'm going to thank God for everything I can think of in the middle, even the silliest thing, like I have a chair to sit on at the laundromat. And I used mm. that time as spiritual practice. Okay, if I have wow. to sit at the laundromat, I'm going to do my Bible study while I'm there. I'm going to pray all the way there. I'm going to pray all the way back. Because I knew the second I let go, mm-hmm. I was going to be a mess. Mm. And I... Uh, I have a quarter in my pocket today, and most days, if really? you ask me, I have a quarter in my pocket 10 years later. Mm. Wow. Because it's just this reminder that turn to God and trust, ask for what you need, trust that he will meet you in it, and sometimes it was actual literal quarters. Wow. So just really has the power to shape us. But those That's disciplines good. I learned then, they stick with me today 10 years mm. later. Mm-hmm. Well, nothing I'm going to say is going to top that story, <laughs> I know. so I'm not going to. <laughs> <laughs> but we all have those things, and I think that's one of the things, too, not to compare our trials. Uh, you know, yeah, his yeah. was his was thankfully a curable cancer, and we'd always feel like, well, you know, and people are like, no, don't go, you have yeah. cancer. Yeah, you, yeah right. you have a trial. A trial is a trial. A cancer is cancer. Don't compare and uh, get into that game. But I don't think you wasted that trial. No. And I, I knew that I that who I would be after would be a different person. Just what kind of person would it be? Well, and isn't it interesting because we talked about, like, we start with perseverance and then we talk growth and then trust. Mm -hmm. And I think of people, we know some people with really strong perseverance, but they haven't grown. It didn't mature. Like, they're able to handle whatever life throws them. They just kind of turned off their emotions, you know, or Mm -hmm. they've withdrawn or they're self-medicating in some way. But it hasn't produced maturity. They have perseverance. They, you know, they're some of the toughest people we might know, Mm -hmm. but but they haven't let them become fully, they're not fully alive people. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that seems like the difference between what you're talking about, what you tried to practice was, I, no, I want to come out of this fully alive. Mm-hmm. I don't want a part of my heart to be dead or to be jaded or anything like that, even though this is really tough. I want to be fully alive when I come out of it. We can live the full abundant life that Jesus talks about in John 10, 10 yep. in yep. the middle of the trials, mm. really leaning mm-hmm. into him. And that's, that takes practice and finding creative ways to do that, lean in. In the middle of it. That's good. Well, as we move to wrap up our time together, Aaron, 
what do you have for us next week? What could we read? We'll be in James, yeah. but how can we prepare yeah. our hearts for the coming weekend? Well, yeah, I was working on it this morning. Um, but we, again, we're in James chapter 1, uh, uh, verses 19 through 27. It's really a conversation about uh, what God is looking for in his followers and mm-hmm. what uh, James uses the phrase religious. What What is the kind of religion that God is looking for? In other words, like, how we express our faith, what should that look like? And so um, it's going to be a pretty challenging conversation. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you quoted one of the verses at the, at the beginning, which is uh, do not merely listen to the word, but, but do it. Do what it says. Mm-hmm. And so there's your gut punch right there. <laughs> Don't we just know prepare. the Bible. Do the Bible. Well, and, and that's, so. that's a huge flashback to, to Jesus, the way he ends the Sermon on the Mount, which right. is kind of what we've been talking yeah. about. Yeah. Like, if you want your life to be an abundant life, full life, do what Jesus says. And that's yep. what he's saying yep. at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Yeah. It involves work. It Something does. I was reading recently says grace is not opposed to effort. It's, oh, opposed, yeah. it's opposed to earning. Yep. Mm-hmm. So yep. we're, we can put some effort in, not yep. to earn it, but to grow. That's good. Yeah. So well, that will be a great conversation. We will just pray that we have all our services this right? weekend and the yeah. snow holds right. off. Yep. <laughs> so thank you all for joining us this week. We really do pray that this conversation was helpful and that it encourages you to make it real. So just a reminder, you can send in your questions about the sermon. You can go to adabible.info and click on this weekend, or we'll put the link to that in the show notes as well. And so check that show notes for links to the different things we mentioned that we'll put links in there and uh, check out the sermon if you haven't done that yet. So thanks for joining us. And just remember, as Pastor Aaron challenged us, we're going to make it real and don't waste your trial. Mm. You can choose to grow, lean in, and become even closer to Jesus through this. So... As we close, we just pray that the Lord would bless you and keep you. The Lord, make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord, turn his face toward you and give you peace. Thanks for joining. We'll see you next time.